He was a talentless loser, but became the leader of the greatest team of treasure hunters in the world. Cry just wanted to live a quiet life in the peaceful village he was born in, because the thought of becoming a treasure hunter who raids treasure vaults and fights monsters was too dangerous for him. However, it was the dream of his childhood friends who made him swear to become famous treasure hunters together and get respected as heroes. Many years have passed since then, and Cry is a young man living in the capital city, where a huge recruitment drive is being organized by one of the largest clans named First Steps. Cry quietly joins the queue and the girl named Ruta begins yapping about how she always goes solo, but she was having some trouble at a treasure vault called White Wolf's Den, so she decided to join a party. Suddenly, one of the guys in the line starts mocking Ruta for thinking that she can clear White Wolf's Den at level 3. She gets angry at Scarface's remarks and things start getting heated between them. Cry wants no part of this bullshit so he tries his best to camouflage with the wall behind him, while a guard comes to break the fight between Ruta and Scarface. Soon, they get inside the tavern and Cry tells Ruta to ask him anything because he has been to many such gatherings before. She asks about the most flashy party first and Cry tells her that it is the best party in this clan, which is led by a blonde playboy named Ark with a level 7 certification, and with just 5 of his teammates, he managed to clear a rank 7 treasure vault. Ruta is amazed to hear that, and asks him about the empty seat besides Ark's party. Before Cry can tell her anything, Scarface comes there and asks her if she doesn't even know that the seat belongs to the leader of the famous Grievers party, who founded the First Steps clan. Scar tells Ruta that the main reason there are so many people here is because Grievers is trying to find a new member for the first time. Suddenly, an angry redhead begins shouting at the organizers of the event, asking where the Grievers party is because he came here just for them. A girl named Tino comes forth to discipline the boy, and even though the guard from earlier tries to stop her, neither of them is ready to back down. The hunters in the tavern are eager to see a fight, and Cry tells Ruta to come out with him so they don't get caught in the crossfire. Meanwhile, Tino starts warming up when suddenly, she senses a familiar presence. She completely ignores the redhead and begins looking around. She suddenly notices Cry and heads towards him ignoring the redhead's attack. Moments later, he gets tackled to the ground by Tino, whose personality has done a 180, and she is no longer the mean killing machine, but a simp for Cry. She calls him master, asking since how long has he been here. Just then, the blonde named Ark comes there and tells Cry that he is late because until the clan master and the leader of Grievers shows up, they can't start. Everyone is dumbfounded on learning that the pathetic loser on the ground is the leader of the formidable clan, and Cry just wants the earth to swallow him at this point. His story started five years ago, when he formed the Grievers party with his childhood friends to achieve their dream. They went to beginner vaults and cleared them quickly. It was only his friends that did all the work though, and Cry was often clueless and vulnerable, but his friends thought that he was acting as a lure for monsters on purpose. He was the only one without any real skill, and he knew he would become a burden to them soon. That is why, he decided to leave the party for the sake of his friends. When he gathered his friends to tell them that he was quitting, they ignored him like my crush ignores me, and said that their party doesn't have a leader, so he should take up the post. Cry was shocked that his resignation was converted into a promotion, but he was given no choice. He became the leader of the party which soon became the strongest in the world. Back to the present, Cry is on his seat with Ark and Tino next to him, fighting for his attention. Ark then says that Cry must have come late on purpose to mix with the applicants and assess them while hiding his identity. Cry wants to tell him that it is not true, and he was just late because he overslept. Then, Ark asks if he found anyone suitable to join their party. Cry's attention goes to the violent redhead from before and he asks him to introduce himself. The boy says his name is Gil, and Cry believes that if Ark's party trains him, he might unlock his potential. He knows that he has no talent in scouting people, but he leaves everything to the god of plot armor as he decides to pick Gil. However, he has a condition before that. Cry says the most important thing for a hunter is strength and the determination to never give up. That is why, he will test everyone to see if they are worthy of joining their clan. He declares that ever since he became a hunter, he has never lost once, and everyone is shocked. Well, he has never been in a proper fight either. Cry takes off one of his rings, declaring that anyone who gets it will get his recommendation to join Ark's party. He tosses the ring towards the crowd and Gil rushes to catch it, but Tino takes action quickly and sends him to the Shadow Realm with a kick from her thick thighs. 
The ring flies away from his hands and begins rolling on the ground, and all the hunters present in the tavern start chasing it like mad dogs. Cry declares that the ring is also a treasure item, so he will let anyone who captures it have it. He wishes everyone best of luck, and then tells Ruta and Scar that he will see them around. The next day, as Cry is chilling in his office, his secretary Eva complains about the mess his little challenge caused yesterday, and informs him that the Treasure Hunter Association also wants to have a chat with him. Cry wants to send Ark on his behalf, but he is not in the city, and he has no choice but to go there. As soon as he reaches the office he immediately grovels before him and begins apologizing. But Chief Gark is not pleased with this apology. He sends his secretary to give Cry a book containing missions no hunter wants to do because they are either lame or extremely difficult. So he begins skimming through the book to find an easy mission and then dump it on someone else. He finds a mission in a level 3 vault about rescuing some hunters and immediately takes it, unaware that it is the most dangerous one. Once Cry reaches the clan office, he finds Tino who is there to show him the ring she won yesterday. He then asks if she is free right now, and Tino thinks it is time for her to get to second base with her master, but he just wants her to do the mission he got from the chief. Tino vanishes from the room like Thanos just snapped his fingers, but Cry uses an artifact that tracks her and ties her down. The rescue mission is in the wolves' den, and Cry knows exactly whom to send there along with Tino. So he forms a party with Ruda, Tino, Scar and Gil to take up this mission. Six years ago, when his group went to register as a party in the Treasure Hunter Association, the redhead named Luke kicked the door open and introduced himself as the strongest swordsman in the world. And just after him, the tan girl Liz declared that she is the greatest thief. Cry cringed so hard at this that he just wanted to die, but his friends kept embarrassing him some more. He went to the receptionist to fill out the party paperwork reluctantly, and the receptionist asked him to pick a party name and symbol. No one had thought about it before, but then Cry purposely chose the lame name Grievers and a poorly drawn skull as their symbol, in the hopes that they'd think he's too cringe to be their leader. Everyone told him that the name and the symbol were crap, to which he responded saying that he just can't get motivated to be a treasure hunter if the party name is something else, but that made his friends immediately change their tone. They told Cry that he had a great naming sense, and they realized it late because they are not as smart as him. Poor Cry had no option now, and that is how the Grievers' party was formed. Back to the present, Cry stands in front of the three treasure hunters who are still processing the fact that he is the leader of Grievers. They question if he is really the level 8 hunter nicknamed Thousand Tricks, which prompts Tino to stand up for him and order everyone to kneel before Master Cry. Cry asks her to stop intimidating them, but the redhead Gil clearly says that he looks too weak to be the real deal. Cry ignores this and asks if everyone here is willing to help Tino explore the level 3 treasure vault. Gil refuses to take orders from Cry, and Scar starts fighting with him, asking him to show some respect to the level 8 hunter. Seeing no way out, Cry decides to drop Gil from the team, but Gil suddenly challenges him to a fight and says that he will become his underling if he loses. Cry accepts his challenge, but tells him to fight Tino, who is the leader of this team and his representative. He accepts the challenge, and they come to the training hall. Gil tells Cry that once he defeats the girl, he will challenge him, but Cry points out that Tino is a level 4 hunter just like him. Tino drops her weapons, saying she doesn't even need them, leading Gil to throw his sword away too. Tino lunges towards Gil before he even has the chance to react. He dodges her first blow, but that was just the setup for a powerful kick that slams him to the wall. Tino is confident that she won, but Gil gets up and charges at her, but then Tino knocks him out with a blow to his neck. She immediately turns to cry for praise and says that she became so strong thanks to him. While she goes to his side to receive some encouraging words, Gil lies on the floor, unable to believe that he lost. He recalls how he was always the strongest kid around and he dreamed of becoming the strongest swordsman. He became a treasure hunter to achieve this dream, but soon became too strong for his party and decided to come here. After that, Cry asks him if he left his old party because of the wide skill difference. The shocked Gil asks how he knows that, and Cry replies that he has been in the same situation, but unlike him, their party stayed strong together. He doesn't say the crucial bit that it was his friends that didn't abandon him. Suddenly, Cry touches his sword with his feet, and his body is covered in flames. Gil is left dumbfounded because he has not been able to manifest flames of this level yet, but Cry can do this much without even holding the sword, 
so he finally accepts that he is monstrously strong. After that, Cry reads the details about the mission. They are going to a treasure vault called the White Wolves' Den to rescue some hunters. The monsters they will face there are ghosts of the Silver Wolves that used to live in the den before they were hunted down. Later, Secretary Eva tells Cry that he shouldn't have sent Tino and others to the dangerous treasure vault, but he shrugs it off, saying that it is just a level 3 vault. Cry says that the sword is a treasure relic, and it was so easy to use that even Gil can manage it without knowing anything about it. He suddenly becomes a relic otaku, saying that the relics found in treasure vaults are amazing, and he wants to collect all of them. He begins fantasizing about Gil's sword and wonders if he should try to buy it from him. Eva scolds him, saying that he already has too many relics, and he replies that every relic is different, so he can never get bored of them. Suddenly, he remembers that he needs to charge his relics, so he goes to a mage in his guild. While the mage charges the relic, she and her partner tells Cry about the phantom wolf seen near the white wolf's den, which wiped out a caravan that had level 3 guards. Also, the monsters in the vault are becoming stronger recently, and even a team of level 5 treasure hunters went missing inside it. Cry is shocked to hear all this, and he immediately pulls out the mission information page. He had not noticed the names and levels of the people he had to rescue when he took the mission. And now that he sees that they are all level 5, he freaks out, thinking that he sent Tino and others to their death. Once he tells the other two, they freak out as well, but think that this is the way Cry trains those who have potential. Cry immediately leaves the room, trying to convince himself that everything will be alright. On the other hand, Tino's party is near the treasure vault, and the atmosphere has started to become creepy. Even though she already knew that Cry had given her a very difficult mission, she comforts the others by saying that she has faith Cry put this party together for some planned reason only he knows. They are suddenly attacked by a powerful wolf monster wearing armor and carrying a weapon. Tino is terrified because she never thought that the monsters here would be of such a high level, but she decides to fight to fulfill the mission her master has given her. Back at Cry's office, he feels guilty about sending Tino and others to danger, so he decides to help them out himself. He pulls a book in his bookshelf to reveal a secret room, where all his relics are kept. Eventually, his eyes go to the small vault with a rather special relic. When he comes out of the room with everything, Eva almost mistakes him for a thief. After realizing he plans to help them, she notices a forbidden relic around his neck, but Cry hides it, saying that he is not going to use it because it is too dangerous. He then gets to the window and tells Eva that he will be back soon. He activates the power of his robe and flies away like a bat in the night sky without knowing that it has no controls and no brakes. Back at the cave Tino's party somehow manages to kill another monster far beyond the level that they are used to and during that encounter, Gil realizes that the mana in his sword has been completely discharged after Cry unleashed the energy from his sword during his demonstration. Scar seems pretty shaken as well while Ruta breathes hard from the effort of killing just one monster. Scar thinks that they should head back since they don't have the appropriate people or level to deal with these monsters, but Tino straight up rejects their plans claiming that Cry sent them over for a reason, and there is no way that they are going to disappoint him. She goes as far saying that Gil's sword being discharged might be a part of his grand plan. With her total belief in Cry, she moves forward, and soon they reach the actual dungeon where they find these wolf monsters waiting outside with guns and bows. They all hide behind some rocks and discuss their plan. Everyone decides that it would be for the best if they avoided confrontation in the open and try to enter the cave first. Gil heroically volunteers to distract the doggos while the others run inside. Tino immediately realizes that Gil has the brain capacity of a toaster as she tells him that the wolves will doggostyle him if he tries anything funny. Gil claims that he still has his legendary sword and even without mana, it is still a formidable weapon, but as the leader of the group, Tino rejects this. She instead decides that she and Ruta will act as distractions while Gil and Scar will attack the monsters from behind. By pushing past their limits, they end up doing pretty well, and they even manage to take down the four wolf monsters. They all seem pretty surprised to see that they are able to beat such strong opponents. Suddenly some more monsters emerge from the cave and the party immediately jumps into action. Tino holds back and observes her temporary team, quickly noting that even though they are a small party, they are pretty strong in their own classes despite their evident flaws. While this was all happening, this stupid simp starts fawning over Cry again, thinking that he must have thought about all this beforehand and sent them to this dungeon specifically so that they can gain more confidence. 
While fighting against the monster, he remembers the time when he shit-talked his own teammates because he felt that they weren't good enough and can't keep up with him. Because of that, he left the team, but he never even thought about how they felt during the whole encounter as they were trying their best to keep up with him. While he is struggling against the beast, Scar regains his footing and pushes the monster away, giving Gil the opportunity to land a massive slash to its chest, killing it immediately. He finally realizes how amazing it could feel to fight in a party where your teammates are not complete retards and moves ahead to the next area. Before walking through the next set of caves, Tino stops them, claiming that she can feel the presence of someone nearby. Scar asks whether it could be the people who were lost in the cave, but Tino thinks that Cry must have arranged for them to fight against a boss monster before they can retrieve the injured party members. She claims that they can't grow if they only take on the safest tasks. This ends up resonating with Scar who claims that she might be right since after becoming a level 4 adventurer, he never felt the need to actually go to higher level dungeons, because he lost his drive and ambition. Tino replies that Cry must have seen through him immediately and that's why he put him in this party so that he can face his fears and grow. She turns around to the rest of the team, telling them that they all were chosen for a reason as Cry is a god and an elaborate mastermind who calculates everything and he isn't just randomly sending them to life-threatening missions. Back outside, Cry is freaking out. He starts going as fast as possible, not realizing that he doesn't have any breaks. Because of that he ends up becoming a pinball as he enters the dungeon while Tino and her party are finally face to face against the giant boss monster. Scar thinks that the boss is way too big for them, and soon the monster tries to hit them with his axe. They all manage to dodge the hit as they run around, Tino realizes that the monster is incredibly powerful and they need a plan to have any chance at defeating it. She notices that the boss is not wearing a helmet, and she thinks that they should aim for its head. She tells Gil to block the next attack while she will try to go in for the killing blow and Gil agrees to the plan without any hesitation. They all get ready to engage once again as the monster steps forward. Gil manages to block its attack with his sword, while Scar attacks it from behind, only to get bitch slapped in the face. Tino quickly rushes towards the beast, dodging the hits while the monster tries attacking Scar again and breaks his sword. The monster would have killed Scar if not for Tino who jumps up on its axe and starts running towards its face. She takes the leap of faith, but unfortunately the beast is much quicker and ends up slashing her across her legs while she stabs him in the back of the neck as she has watched too much attack on Titan. The plan works out for them as the monster disappears while she drops to the ground and takes out a health potion to heal her wound. Gil and Scar both are relieved that they are alive as they walk towards Tino who gives Scar her sword, claiming that she can survive without it for a bit. Suddenly she senses something and dodges a spear heading towards her from the darkness. They are all incredibly shocked at this since the boss is already dead, but soon four more boss monsters emerge from the darkness, carrying several different weapons. This time even Tino feels like Cry went a little overboard as one boss was enough, but she is not going to let him down. She gets up once again and plans to quickly enter the nearby narrow cave where the beasts won't be able to chase them, but one of the monsters immediately covers the entrance, blocking their escape. Scar and Gil both speak up telling the girls that they will act as bait while they quickly escape through the caves. Ruta tries to argue, but Scar tells her not to worry as everyone dies one day and it's better that some of them survive today. Tino on the other hand is not willing to sacrifice anyone as she wonders what Cry would have done in this situation. Suddenly she remembers that she has the magical ring that he gave her. She tells them to back her up so all three of them quickly attack the monster in quick succession one after the other while Tino uses the ring which can shoot an air bullet at the enemy and charges it before blasting the monster's eyes with it. The boss monster starts flailing around while Gil decides to go for the killing blow. Unfortunately, he ends up getting smacked away and by the time Tino tries to help him, all the monsters are already on top of them. Just when they thought everything was over, Cry bursts into the cave and blasts the monster away into the wall. Tino is surprised to see him here, while Scar realizes that these beasts seem scared of him. One of the monsters tries to attack him, but thanks to Cry's protective relics, nothing happens to him. Cry quickly shoots a magic blast at the monster using his magic rings. The attack blasts the monster into the wall once again. He quickly takes out a smoke bomb and uses it to give everyone some cover to run away and thanks to that, they all manage to escape. Cry then quickly heals Tino's legs after which he tells them all to follow him, 
even though he himself is scared about not knowing what lies ahead in their adventure. He keeps walking with his head down, because he has absolutely no idea where he is and wishes that someone would take the lead and actually escort them instead. But all the party members have total belief in him, as they expect him to know everything. After some aimless wandering, Gil finally asks Cry whether they are heading for the exit. Cry stays quiet but Tino speaks up, claiming that he definitely has some other plans as she already knows the entire layout of the caves and they are heading in a totally different direction. Cry cries on the inside wondering whether Tino is mad at him for sending them here and is intentionally not helping, but he decides to keep walking when suddenly all the remaining party members freeze as they ask Cry how he knew they needed to come here. Tino excitedly claims that Cry knows everything, and they all run ahead into the cave where they find the injured party that got lost in the vault. Cry is surprised to see them here because he definitely ran into them accidentally. The leader of the injured party named Rod thanks them for the help, but Tino tells him to thank Cry as he led them here. Cry immediately claims that it was just a coincidence, but obviously his party members think that he is just being humble. Ruta gives them the meds she had, but it is not enough, and they are still too weak since they haven't eaten anything in a while. Thankfully Cry remembers that he is carrying an infinite chocolate bag relic, and hands everyone some chocolates. Scar starts talking to Rod, claiming that he never expected a level 5 party to have trouble in this cave, and even Gil claims that the wolf monsters were definitely strong, but not strong enough to eradicate a fully stacked level 5 party. Rod seems surprised by that and claims that they didn't get shit on by the wolves as they never really saw them around. It turns out that a total Sigma phantom monster appeared in front of them all alone and mauled them completely. He claims that the phantom must be a special monster because it was strong enough to control even the wolf bosses, adding that he thinks that the phantom might be even stronger than the sword saint himself. This takes everyone aback as everyone in the imperial capital knows that the sword saint is the strongest swordsman alive right now. Cry simply munches down on his Snickers as he knows that the Sword Saint is none other than his childhood friend Luke. But he doubts that this phantom is anywhere near as strong as rumored as Luke would have made sure to kill the monster long ago. Still, he thinks it must be stronger than what he can handle, and wishes that he waited for the pretty boy Ark to handle this mission. Everyone inside the cave immediately turns towards Cry for further guidance while he simply turns away in shame as he has no idea what to do. Finally, he decides to trick them to get some more time, and tells Tino that she is the leader of this party, and it is her job to lead them. Tino isn't too confident about it, but Cry claims that this would be good training and gaslights her into becoming the leader. Tino is very happy to hear that Cry trusts her so much and promises that she will not disappoint him. They start walking through the labyrinth of caves and soon find the exit of the cave visible in the distance. However, that gives them even more anxiety as they get worried about the phantom showing up, but Rod tells Tino that he will act as a shield for them so they can escape safely. Tino shoots down the idea, claiming that they are all returning safely since Cry is with them. Suddenly, they start hearing the howls of the wolf bosses coming towards them, which immediately puts them all on edge. Tino feels something incredibly strong coming in their direction and even Cry can feel the presence so he quickly shields her while thinking about all the relics that he has including the relic that gives him extra lives. He currently has 5 extra lives, which means on the 6th hit, he is as good as dead. Finally, the deadly phantom becomes visible, walking towards them with his sword out. This scares the crap out of everyone but to make matters worse, a second figure appears behind the phantom, which is simply too much even for the brave Tino. She starts trembling and hides behind Cry begging him to save them. Cry however stops being worried as he recognizes the second figure and wonders what she is doing here. Without even a single word, the mysterious person becomes Ronaldo and kicks the phantom with such a strong kick that it gets embedded into the walls of the cave. The masked woman walks up to Cry asking whether everything is okay and removes her mask to show that she is none other than the lowly Liz, now all grown up. The young members wonder in awe how a human can be this strong but this pisses Liz off as she wonders how they can be monster hunters without even knowing who the Grievers are. She tells Cry that she came all the way to the city to meet him, but when she arrived at the mansion she heard that he was out in the cave to help the party out. She then tells him to back off as she needs to talk with her student and immediately moves over to Tino, who was hiding behind Cry. Liz starts shit-talking the poor girl claiming that she can't believe that Tino is so useless that she can't even survive this stupid cave alone and had to ask Cry for help. 
Gil thinks that this is too much and tries to stop her, but gets such a strong back kick that he gets blasted into the wall. Liz then continues to berate Tino until she completely breaks down on the floor, but Liz has no plans of stopping and Cry is too much of a wuss to intervene until Tino gets on all fours and apologizes to Liz for her failures. He thinks that this is too much and finally intervenes, telling Liz that Tino did an excellent job during the quest, which is all thanks to her excellent training. Liz immediately changes her entire persona as she becomes a sweet girl who asks whether she has done a good job or not. Suddenly they realize that the Phantom has re-emerged from the wall and behind him is a giant wolf boss from America with a huge minigun in his hand. This pisses Liz off as she puts her mask back on as the wolf starts shooting at them. She moves so fast the time kinda slows down, and she catches all the bullets with ease. Then, she jumps towards the beast and kills it with a single kick to its head. This monster of a woman then turns her attention towards the phantom who is getting ready to attack her. She casually catches the sword barehanded, knees the phantom in the air, and then punches him down on the ground. Poor Tino starts crying, and while Cry feels bad for her, he knows better than to get involved as he doesn't want himself to be manhandled by Liz like the phantom who finally dies after Liz literally punches through its head. Finally Liz calms down a little and hugs Cry while claiming that she missed him. They safely escape after that and the next morning, Gil comes back to the training ground and gives his magic sword to Tino, claiming that he wants Cry to have it as he is going to train from scratch once again as he wants to become as strong as Liz one day, but the other members don't seem that optimistic about that. Meanwhile Tino thinks about the strange masks that the Grievers wear. It turns out that Cry put in the order to create those masks for them. One day, Cry begins to look around for the slime that is supposed to be in the capsule around his neck. He got it a year ago from the most talented alchemist in his clan, who often gave her final products to him for safekeeping. They were mostly dangerous items, and she had told him that if he became careless with the slime and released it, it could destroy the entire capital city which is why it is very alarming that he cannot find it. Cry knows that if he thinks any more about it, his two remaining brain cells will overheat and explode, so he convinces himself that the slime was never in the capsule, and he has been worried over a whole lot of nothing. He then goes to the clan building, where his secretary Eva tells him that the Treasure Hunter Association wants a report on the White Wolf's den. Cry tells her to send Tino with a report because she was the team leader. Eva informs him that Tino is training with Liz right now, and he immediately pities the poor girl. He then abruptly asks Eva if something noteworthy has happened in the capital. She tells him that nothing has happened, but she will start investigating, and he tells her that there is no need. He decides to pay Tino a visit and leaves everything else to Eva, who begins thinking about how Cry has been correct whenever he has made a prediction. She believes that since he is worried about the capital, something serious and terrible is going to happen soon. In the meantime, Cry reaches the training hall and finds a lot of grumpy hunters gathered outside the gates. A level 6 hunter named Sven tells Cry to get Liz under control, because he is the only one who can tame a beast like her. Everyone else needs to practice as well, but Sven is more worried about Tino dying if the training continues. Cry passes his remark off as a joke, but as the gate to the training hall is opened, he finds Tino lying on the ground while Liz menacingly stands in front of her badly insulting her and demanding she get up. When she doesn't get up, the violence crazed Liz decides to end her with a powerful kick. Luckily, Cry stops her before she can attack, and Liz stares at him creepily, asking if he is really stopping her. He affirms with a smile on his face, and says that Tino has reached her limits so she should let her rest for today. She quickly returns to her cheerful self and tells Cry that she will let Tino rest since she can't fight anymore, but then suddenly, Tino grabs her leg. She uses all her strength to get up because she wants to look cool in front of Cry, and tells Liz that she can fight more. Liz is ecstatic to hear this, and as the two girls get ready for round two, Cry leaves the training hall because he knows that he will die if he stays here. Outside, Sven thinks that this was Cry's grand plan to motivate Tino to become harder, and Cry lets him believe whatever he wants. After that, they sit down for tea and Sven tells him that apparently the case with the White Wolves' den is still not resolved, and some phantoms are still attacking the people on the northern road. He asks Cry what should they do, and obviously, he has no idea. Cry hopes that Ark was here right now, because he is better than him in everything, except maybe plot armor. Suddenly he gets an idea, and decides to push the case to Sven and his team. 
he sends them to the Hunter Association to meet Gark and tells Sven to think of it as training. Cry happily leaves, impressed with his quick problem solving, but one of Sven's subordinates is not impressed with him. He says that despite being the leader, he has never seen Cry do anything worthwhile. Sven tells him that he should not judge Cry so easily, because that guy is a true monster. On the other hand, Gark from the Hunter Association thinks the same thing. He believes that while everything seems the same with the White Wolves' den, Cry must definitely know something, because he won't go there without any reason. Far away from them, in an underground lab, an old wizard is also thinking about Cry's involvement in the recent case. He is a member of a secret organization called the Akashic Tower, that is trying to research ways to create treasure vaults artificially by manipulating the energy flowing within the Earth. The old wizard is the mastermind behind the plan, and he was behind the mutation of phantoms in the White Wolves' den as well. However, he never imagined that a high-level hunter like Cry would enter the treasure vault and find out about their plan. The old wizard deems him a danger, and says that they must abandon this location and go to another place to continue their research because they can't fight him without their head of security who is currently out of town. Meanwhile, Cry has a nightmare about a giant black slime that burns the entire city. He wakes up sweating because the heat from the burning city was too real, but turns out that the cause of the heat was Liz, who has snuck into his bed. This is nothing new for Cry, and he doesn't even get a raise out of Liz because he has been there and done that. She asks him if he is free today, because she is taking a break from work and training, and they should use this chance to go on a playdate. Cry decides to agree to whatever plan she has because it is better than working. However, as they go to the clan building, they are shocked to find Gark, who came here since Cry kept making excuses. He tells Cry that they need to talk, but Liz stands up to him and tells him to clean up his mess himself and stop relying on Cry. Gark grows furious at this and complains about her leaving a high-priority mission incomplete, but she tells Baldi to stop disturbing their date. They keep on bickering, and Cry thinks that he is witnessing a roast battle between Eminen and Gordon Ramsay. Suddenly, the battle of curses turns into an actual fight, and Cry asks Gark's assistant to come upstairs so that at least they can talk like civilized people. He reads a report about the White Wolves' den, and tells the assistant that there was nothing remarkable when he saw it. He says that he is worried about something else, but immediately realizes that he slipped and revealed something he should not have. The assistant asks him to elaborate and he acts shady and mysterious as he says that he can't say anything right now, but his clan will cooperate with the association. He asks her to talk to Ark about this matter from now on because he can help her. Downstairs, Liz and Gark are still at it, and the reception is pretty much destroyed. The agile Liz keeps getting an upper hand on Gark, even though they are equally matched in terms of strength. She fools around, telling him that he has grown old and his joints must be making popping sounds when he moves this much. Enraged by her insults, he uses his full power, but Liz easily dodges his attacks and keeps him under pressure. Just then, Cry comes down and asks both of them to stop. While Gark is in no mood to back down, Liz immediately rushes to Cry's side and clings to him saying that they should resume their date now. Everyone goes their separate ways, and Cry and Liz go out on their play date. He asks her about the level 8 treasure vault she was exploring, and she tells him that it was really fun, and the monsters there are the best. However, she got bored after a while and returned to see him. His thoughts venture to the missing slime again, and he wonder if it will really put the city in danger. Liz asks him why is he looking so down, and he asks her what would she do if the country gets destroyed. Without missing a beat, she says that she will run away to a tropical island and enjoy a long vacation. Cry is taken aback at her positive and carefree attitude and thinks that he should learn something from her. Suddenly, Liz gives him her bag and goes to subdue a random man on the street. Cry panics as he asks her what is she doing, and she says that this guy was stalking them. Cry tells her that she is being paranoid and asks her to let the guy go. The man freaks out a bit as he sees Cry and then runs away which makes Liz think that this was all part of his plan. She says that his acting was too great, and then asks him why he let the guy go. She wants to know what is their next move, but Cry doesn't even know what she is talking about. The next day, Cry and Liz go to the most dangerous part of the city, and she still thinks that this is a date. Cry tells her that it is not a date, and he is here on business. According to information he received from Eva, a lot of people have been missing from the slums, and though it is not something that would concern him otherwise, he is worried that the missing slime might be involved in it somehow. 
As a bonus, there is also a new ice cream shop nearby, and Cry plans to check it out after just doing the bare minimum for his mission. He tells Liz that they should check out the ice cream store first, and she is really happy, but the owner of the ice cream shop is not. He is the same guy whom Liz caught last time, but Cry let him go. He fears that Cry really let him get away on purpose, and now he is here to capture him. He doesn't even understand how he could learn that this ice cream shop was just a front to one of the research bases of the Akashic Tower. He plans to close the shop immediately, but then the door suddenly opens and a redhead named Sophia comes there. The man sees some hope for himself now because Sophia is actually the in charge of all the defense-related issues in their organization. Outside their gate, Liz gets impatient and tries to blow the door away, but Cry stops her, saying that maybe the shop doesn't open today. She reluctantly obeys him, and they go back to their clan, much to the fake shopkeeper's relief. Back in his office, Cry asks Liz if she knows when will the alchemist Citri return from the level 8 treasure vault. Liz says that she may take some time, and Cry only hopes that she returns before her slime destroys the entire city. Just then, Eva comes to the office and tells him that the Hunter Association has formed a team to investigate the White Wolves' den. It seems they are going all out this time, sending even a relic expert to see if they can find anything new. Cry thinks that it seems to be a big deal, but that doesn't bother him because he is not going there anyway. On the other hand, the shopkeeper reaches the headquarters of Akashic Tower and tells everyone that Cry found him. He is terrified because Cry saw through their perfect disguise and then didn't even take any actions against them. He shivers, saying that he can't even guess what is going on inside Cry's mind, and others also feel clueless in this situation. They turn to Sophia for suggestions, and she tells them that they should fight against Cry and his clan head-on. Everyone is shocked, but she assures them that they have a chance to win even though their enemy is at level 8. She is confident that the security system she has built can win against Cry's clan and the old mage gives her the permission to do as she wants because they can't back away from this fight forever. The next day, the building of the First Steps clan is packed to the brim with adventurers. As Tino enters the building, she is shocked to see so many people and asks a guy what the hell is going on. He tells her that they have gathered here to investigate the White Wolves' den, and Tino thinks this is a bit of overkill. However, the man tells her that Cry was planning to send Ark there first, and Tino is even more shocked. Sending a level 7 hunter like Ark to a level 3 treasure vault means that the matter is more serious than anyone can anticipate. That is why, the association and their clan have brought together a large number of treasure hunters to compensate for that. Soon, Cry and Eva also come there, and Cry asks if all these people have gathered for some sort of party. Eva tells him that they are going to investigate the White Wolf's den. She explains that since Cry requested Ark to take care of the job, she assembled a force that could serve as his substitute. That comes as a shock to Cry, because he mentioned Ark because he is the typical Mr. Perfect who does everything perfectly. He thinks that deploying these many people will cost him a ton, so he suggests that they reduce the number by half. The hunters freak out on hearing that because they think that they are going to die now. Eva calms everyone and says that Cry must have something important to tell them, which he obviously does not. He tries telling them that the difficulty of the mission won't be as high as they think, but they refuse to believe him. Cry turns to Eva and asks about the rewards for the hunters and learns that Chief Gark has issued additional funds to make sure everyone is paid well. With the money issue resolved, Cry tells the hunters to do as they please, and they are glad that they can all go to the vault together. Just then, Liz arrives there, calling them a bunch of sissies who are too weak and don't even have the guts to overcome challenges to become strong. She jumps up to Cry's place, telling him that she will take this mission, and she just needs Tino to come with her. Cry immediately refuses to entertain her request because he doesn't want to endanger Tino's life, and doesn't want the morale of other people to go down. He says that everyone here will go on the mission, and then Eva tells him to take command of the group. Cry is taken aback to hear this, but everyone else is relieved, thinking that their safety is guaranteed since the clan master is coming with them. Cry realizes that he can't simply say that he is not going to come with them, so he says that he will be joining them later, until then, Sven, who is already at the White Wolf's den, will take the command. Before everyone leaves, Cry tells one guy to beware of slime monsters in the odd case they are present in the vault. The team of treasure hunters go to the treasure vault, unaware that it is the base of Akashic Tower, who think that Cry has sent the treasure hunters to deal with them. 
While they are torn between how to react, Sophia says that this is their chance to attack the hunters when they are still not ready. She says that her defense system has been designed to fight against the most powerful hunters, and only the Grievers' party combined can beat it. However, only Cry, Liz and the alchemist Citri are near the capital right now, and she already has plans on how to beat Cry and Liz. Citri is the only one she doesn't have a foolproof strategy against, but it seems that Sophia has some personal score to settle with her, and she declares that she will crush her personally. She says that Citri found out their master's theory about creating new treasure vaults, and she has been trying her hand at that too. Sophia says that they can't let her do that, and asks the wizard permission to use their entire firepower to stop her. The wizard gives her the permission and makes her the commander of their forces for this battle, but his number two doesn't seem to be thrilled about it. Above them, Sven and his party don't find anything unusual, but he still believes that Cry sent them here for some special purpose. Suddenly, he gets a call and asks his teammate to blow the emergency whistle to alert the other treasure hunters. Once they get outside, Sven tells them Cry's message about watching out for a slime monster, and the treasure hunters are pissed because they are supposed to be taking orders from a man who doesn't even have the balls to be present on site. Sven tells them to trust Cry's judgment, and then recites a story about how he once invited everyone to a flower-watching party and told them to bring their weapons. Just as Cry made the toast, a treasure vault manifested behind him, and everyone realized that he predicted this. The hunters are taken aback by this, and Sven once again tells them that the information Cry gives is more valuable than anything else they can find. Back in Cry's office, Liz is pestering him to give her some work too, because she wants to show off her fighting skills in front of him. Cry is already irritated by her behavior, and wonders how long does he have to tolerate her before the hunters can solve the issue in the White Wolf's den, and he can just show his face there at the end. Just then, the alchemist Citri arrives there, telling Cry that she is here to help him deal with an incredibly strong and clever organization that can become a threat to the entire world soon. Cry immediately kicks Liz and Tino out of the office as he hears the details about Akashic Tower from Citri, and on the other side of the city, Gark also dons his battle armor to enter the treasure vault and prove that his glory days are still not over. His assistant tries to stop him because he is definitely going to pull some muscles and break his back. Suddenly, Citri comes to see him and share some important information about their true enemies. Back in Cry's office, he thinks about how Citri was the only other one of their friend's circle who was not overwhelmingly strong. She always knew that she won't be able to fight on the front lines and wanted to do something else to support her friends. That time, Cry was the one who gave her the idea of being an alchemist, and that was how she became the greatest alchemist. Citri tells Cry that the slime she created has the ability to rapidly adapt to its surroundings and evolve, but it is an unstable failed prototype. However, she has made sure that it will never target her or Cry, and he freaks out, thinking that the rest of the city is still in danger. He has told Citri that he doesn't know how and when the slime went missing, so she simply believes that it must have come out of the capsule and escaped through the drainage. Cry is a bit relieved that she trusts him blindly, and then Citri says that there is something else she needs to talk about, which can be even more dangerous than the runaway slime. Back in the White Wolf's den, Swen learns from the reinforcements that Cry is not going to join them anytime soon, and he did not allow Liz to come either. Sven is Loki relieved that he didn't send the wild Liz here, and then decides to give all the treasure hunters a pep talk. He asks them if they are prepared to fight a slime, and all the hunters reply that even kids can defeat slimes, and they don't need to worry about them at all. Well, Sven knew this would happen, and he curses Cry for not giving them more helpful information. Just then, one very ugly hunter decides to go into the vault because he thinks coming up with strategies is for weaklings. Everyone mocks him, and Sven says that he can happily become the first victim of the monsters, and they will learn something from his death. The ugly moron calls them a bunch of sisses as he heads inside, and then someone timidly raises her hand to ask a question. The redhead looks a lot like Sophia, the defense head of Akashic Tower, but she claims to be an alchemist belonging to Cry's clan. She says that she worked together with Citri on researching slimes, and then takes out a vial of medicine, saying that it can kill any slime, no matter how powerful it is. After that, Sven pumps up the treasure hunters, telling them to aim for glory but return home alive. The investigation begins, and as the day ends, they find nothing but the wolf phantoms that are slightly stronger than normal. Sven wonders if Cry was wrong this time, but thinks that it will be a good thing if that is true. 
Just then, the ugly asshole with a negative ick comes there and says that if everyone around here was not afraid of slimes, the mission would have already been over by now. He goes to the forest to water a tree, and curses cry for giving orders but not having the balls to come to the site of action. Suddenly, he hears a strange sound and goes to check it out. He is shocked to find two men and a huge chained wolf beast. The men belong to the Akashic Tower, and they are here to put Hulk's nut inside the wolf so that it can become super strong and take down as many hunters as it can, just according to Sophia's plan. Ugo there, realizes something is wrong when he sees the giant injection and rushes ahead to beat the two guys. He knocks out one guy, but the other shoots fireballs at him. He blocks them too, before bitch slapping him, and then picks up the tall guy to thrash him first and ask questions later. The tall guy asks if he was sent by Cry, but Ugo says that this is all him. While he is pummeling this guy, his partner injects the power-boosting serum into the wolf, who suddenly starts melting on the outside, but becomes even more dangerous because of it. The two guys declare that this monster will seek the greatest amount of mana nearby and absorb it to become even stronger. The monster instantly sucks the mana out of the two wizards, and Ogo blows the warning whistle to alert everyone. Sven tells everyone to get ready to fight as soon as he hears the whistle, and they gather outside the forest, armed and ready. Soon, Ugo comes running, severely injured and missing an arm, as he says that Cry was right the entire time, and a powerful slime monster is present in the forest. Just then, the wolf phantom who has turned into a slime because of the melting serum comes there, and Sven shoots an arrow at it, aiming to destroy its legs before anything else. The magicians blast fire and ice attacks at the wolf slime, but nothing phases it. Meanwhile, Sven and the healer go to check up on Ugo, who tells them that he saw two mysterious bastards injecting the wolf phantom with something and turning it into a slime. The wolf slime comes out of the magic barrage unharmed, and Sven decides to try physical attacks. He aims his bow at the slime and rapid fires half a dozen arrows, but they don't do any damage to the wolf slime. Sven is shocked to see that neither magical nor physical attacks work on the slime, but he still tells the hunters that they will fight for as long as they can. The slime wolf starts attacking them, and Sven tells them to keep their distance and evade the attacks because the monster is quite slow. He then runs to Not Sophia and asks for the anti-slime chemical she had. She tells him that the slime should self-destruct if it touches the medicine, and Sven takes up the mission to make sure that happens. He starts running as he tries to lure the wolf slime, who suddenly leaps at him. Sven quickly plants the vial in the ground and gets to the side. The wolf slime falls on the vial and breaks it, and as it touches the chemical, numerous explosions take place inside its body. Everyone thinks that this will be the end of the fight, but the wolf slime eats up the explosions and still survives. Sven is disheartened because the wolf didn't turn out to be a slime after all or it would have died. The armored guy next to him says that Cry said it was a slime-like creature and not a slime, and Sven begins cursing him and the grievers. Suddenly, Citri arrives there to help because she literally begged Cry to put her in charge of the white wolf's den. She tells Sven that the reason they can't harm the wolf slime is because its dense mana is acting as a barrier. She is interested in this unique monster she has never seen before, but one quick look at it, and she figures out exactly how did the wolf phantom melt and turn into a slime. She approaches the dangerous monster, casually dodging its attacks as she realizes that it is hunting people with most mana to restore its body to normal. She pities it, thinking that it is someone's failed experiment, and decides to mercy kill it. She throws a vial at the slime wolf and asks Sven to shoot it. This upgraded version of Hawkeye accurately shoots down the vial and the wolf slime's head with that. She tells him that it was anti-mana metal that nullifies the monster's defenses. Just then, Gark also arrives there in his full battle gear, and Sven gets taken aback on seeing him like this. Citri explains that she asked Gark for a lift earlier, because unlike her sister Liz, she couldn't just run all the way here. That doesn't clear Sven's questions, so Citri tells him that she has an idea about what just happened, and who is behind it. She leads everyone to a camp, where she explains the existence of Akashic Tower and its leader Master Magus. The big shot office worker looking guys say that Magus was banned from the Imperial capital long ago, and she asks them if they really think bans are useful. She tells them that this vault is the base of the Akashic Tower, and Not Sophia suggests that they might have a lot of important equipment here. Citri really knows this girl, and she affirms, saying that it is true, and to stop anyone from finding their research, Akashic Tower is preparing for battle. 
She is determined to stop them and their illegal and dangerous experiments, and for that, she asks everyone to follow her. She says that she is not cry, but she will still try her best. Later, as everyone gets ready for the fight, Sven's assistant says that Citri seems quite courageous. He asks him not to underestimate that girl, because she uses the fact that she is weak to utilize any means possible to win, and in that sense, she is as much of a monster as the other grievers. On the other hand, Liz is grinding on Cry's lap while asking him to let her go and help Citri because she is the weakest, but he firmly refuses to entertain her tantrums. Deep inside the White Wolves' den, in the hideout of the Akashic Tower, the Big Shots are reading an instruction manual left behind by Sophia. She has written that they should release the captured phantoms one by one, but the men don't agree with that because it would make it easier for the hunters to defeat them. Even though their master has given full authority to Sophia, the men think that a woman cannot know nothing about war, and thus they must take charge of the situation. They decide to ignore her instructions and launch all the phantoms at the same time. Outside the cave, Citri and other adventurers are interrogating the two members of the Akashic Tower they have captured. Citri promises to let both of them go free if they can tell her the location of their master Magus. The two dumbasses are ready to sacrifice their life for their master, but that was actually a trick question and Citri just wanted to confirm that Magus was indeed the mastermind behind the whole operation. She tells the two prisoners that they can do it the easy way, or the way she likes. They refuse to talk so she pulls out a truth serum to use on them. But the government officials have the Book of Law stuck inside their ass, and they tell her that using things that can manipulate other people's minds is against the law. Citri just asks them if they care more about the law than catching Magus, and even Gark takes her side, telling the officials to let her do her job. She assures everyone that she was just playing mind games and the truth serum is just some exotic fruit-flavored Gatorade. She drinks it all, and then suddenly, a loud roar rattles the camp. Everyone goes outside and finds a giant wolf slime coming towards them, and this time it is red and faster than the previous one. Citri says they will need to analyze the barriers around it to destroy it, and for that, she needs the tankers to stand in front of the monster and endure its attacks. Despite being terrified, a tanker does as she says, and the monster instantly sends his shield flying. Citri then commands the magicians to attack the wolf slime from all sides, while she figures out that its magic barrier makes it immune to close combat attacks. She wonders how can they deal with it, when suddenly, a blue wolf slime comes there. Everyone panics and thinks that they should retreat immediately, but Citri says that she never knew Akashic Tower had idiots in charge when it is supposed to be an organization of researchers. She tells everyone to stop attacking and retreat to safety, and just then, the two monsters come face to face. They begin pummeling each other, and Citri explains that the wolf slimes go after the enemy with the most amount of mana, and that makes them attack their own teammates. Soon, more wolf slimes come there and they begin fighting among each other, while the two prisoners are shocked to see their powerful weapon fail. Back inside their base, Magus lectures the morons who made this mistake and didn't even stop after seeing the first two monsters fighting with each other. Sophia is in touch with them through a communication device, and she says that they can't do anything about the monsters now, but they have more tricks up their sleeve. However, she tells everyone that the situation outside has changed because Citri and Gark have joined the hunters. Magus Loki panics on hearing Gark's name, but Sophia says that they still have a good chance to win. She says that retreating is out of option because the hunters have two of their men as prisoners, and even if they don't speak up, Citri will find out the location of their base sooner or later. She says that they should lure the enemy to their base before they can get ready for it, and then destroy them all with a master's trump card. First, she wants to deploy a crazy strong beast called Malice Eater to overwhelm the hunters, but since it is still in training mode, someone needs to take control of it. She tells the moron named Flick who screwed up the last task that this is his chance to show his full potential, and asks him to control the Malice Eater to round up all the hunters. Flick is taunted by her words, and he swears before Magus that he will lure the hunters to the base. Back at the base of treasure hunters, Not Sophia watches Citri busy with work, and begins thinking how Citri was always a genius who had no competition. She was awfully motivated and hardworking, and Not Sophia often felt insecure of being in her shadow. Suddenly, Sven approaches her and snaps her out of her thoughts. He begins talking about how her anti-slime medicine didn't work on the monster earlier because that wasn't a slime, and Cry should have told them more details. He then quickly changes the topic and asks her why are the two prisoners staring at her, because as far as he is concerned, she is not the most attractive 
in this camp. Not Sophia says that she has no idea about that and Sven tells her to come to him if anything happens. Soon after that, Citri figures out the location of the Akashic Tower base by analyzing the terrain and the flow of mana in the region. Everyone is surprised, and then Citri asks the prisoners if her guess was right. Their panicked reactions are enough to confirm her theory, and they immediately call out to the redhead alchemist to free them, calling her Sophia. The hunters ask what they are talking about, and Citri says that Sophia is her arch enemy and a student of Magus. She has tried to find her for a long time but could never find more than a trace. She believes that capturing Sophia and Magus are absolutely necessary to destroy Akashic Tower, and she plans to settle the score with Sophia for good this time. Not far away from them, Cry, Liz and Tino are approaching the base. Liz basically dragged him all the way here, and Cry thinks that he is going to die because his relics are not fully charged and he doesn't have enough safety rings either. Back at the camp, the hunters are heading to Akashic Tower's base, and the ugly ass hunter tells Citri that if he had put faith in Cry's words earlier, he wouldn't have broken his arm. He is eager to know more about Cry, and Citri says that he is the man who will become a level 10 hunter one day. The ugly guy is surprised to hear this, but after everything that has happened today, he believes that Cry is just so strong. Citri says that Cry is strong, but even if he was weaker than a rabbit, he would still be the best treasure hunter among them. Just then, lightning passes through the clouds, attracting everyone's attention, and the very next moment, a powerful lightning bolt shoots directly at Citri. It was shot by the guy named Flick, who is riding the flying lion monster, while boasting about his ultimate spell that can kill anyone instantly. He gets down to the ground where all the hunters have been knocked out, and says that now he will prove to the master that he is better than Sophia. To his shock, Citri suddenly gets up and tells that she is used to this level of spells because there are worse things she has experienced in high-level treasure vaults. Flick freaks out because it was his ultimate spell, but then Citri shoots Sven with a water gun, instantly healing him. He charges at Flick and knocks him out before attacking the lion monster, who easily knocks him back. It attacks him, but then suddenly Gart comes there and slashes the monster in half with his axe, while Citri heals everyone with the water gun. Back in the base, Magus is furious because the moron Flick only took one of the monsters with him when he was supposed to take all of them. His subordinates tell him that Flick's ultimate attack was useless and the hunters are still coming towards their base. They want Magus to escape while they hold off the hunters, but he is opposed to that idea. He declares that they still have a trump card and Sophia, until both have lost, they cannot abandon their base. He says that watching over the battles of his disciples is his duty, and everyone is moved to tears. Magus commands them to keep fighting with all their strength, and his subordinates swear that they will win. Meanwhile, Citri and others have found the entrance to Akashic Tower's base, but Sven doesn't think they should go in without preparation. Gark tells him that he is all the preparation they need. He asks Citri and Sven to trust him and head into the cave, because he wants to show Liz that he has still got the dog in him. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing and watch the video on your screen next.